now are something that I wanted to initiate in this discussion. So I just clicked recording. So I'm going to hell with you on here. I'm, I'm going to give you a bit of an update. Um, the, the biggest issue, and that's why I have these calls, it's the good of the game, and the game isn't good. And it isn't good because of the allocation of ice time by coaches at every age. Nope. And if you are able to get a handle on that, and Tom has a handle, Rick has a handle, I think all the university coaches seem to coach what I call in a balanced, motivational, transmit fa belief fashion. Uh, but in minor hockey, that's not true. And coaches are cycled and there are problems and there's a lack of leadership and the governing bodies responsible for that. And I've advocated the mission statement exercise, but I want to tell you a story about hockey Newfoundland, Tim, before I turn it over to you. Um, when I went to Hockey Newfoundland, now, hell, what you might not understand, we have branches and every province has a governing body. And they're pretty independent of one another, but yet they're under the umbrella of Hockey Canada. So, but independent from them as well. Yes. And they still sort of do their own thing and Hockey Canada can't mandate and they let them take or leave some things, but if you want to be certified, you have to follow their program. So Hockey Newfoundland, and back in the day when I was working um, for Hockey Canada and I left the coaching role to a scout and development role, I traveled to all the provinces in Canada and uh, got to meet the leadership people at every branch in the province, especially when it came to a female camp. Now, that doesn't mean I met the president of the provincial association, but I met the highest ranking director of female hockey, for instance, in every province. So I got to preach about what I wanted implemented at Hockey Canada, which was a philosophy of ice time and also provide a technical bake, a base for coaches to follow so we would all be on the same page. So I'm really glad Mike got on because, Mike, we're going to be talking about a document I've emailed to all of you produced by Hockey Newfoundland that I believe you should pass on to anybody in your leadership network it is a solution, Mr. Architect, to the problems that we're talking about on a weekly basis. But when I went to Newfoundland to work with a female team the first year, the province of Newfoundland for uh, our American friends, and, and not every Canadian might not understand this, it's relatively isolated and they have a unique culture uh, a down-to-earth type culture that um, it's revealed in a, in a movie and a play after 9-11. An awful lot of American citizens were had to spend time there. And the, the lifestyle of the Newfies, as we call them, the most down-to-earth people I've ever met. In fact, in Eastern Canada, I have to say... Um, very authentic population. <clears throat> and when I went to this camp, I, I really sensed that with the leadership group and sensed it working with the young athletes. And when I had this document sent to me from a leader of Hockey Nova Scotia, who's on their female council, he shared it with me. And the email I sent to you, that's his email. It isn't Hockey Nova, Nova Scotia's up. It's not a proposal. This is being implemented by Hockey Newfoundland. So just as a, re, uh, a quick analysis of it, um, they have broken down the age categories at the top. Novice, 
which would be, you know, like you have U9, U11, U13, U15, U17, and U20. And they distinguish between equal ice time and novice and atom. And it's mandatory. And then discretionary ice time at the U13 and above levels, which basically said it's equal in the first two periods. But in the third period, it's discretionary. And it can be in all special teams. And the word discretionary is on the coach. The last three minutes of a period and overtime. They are allowed to basically shorten the bench. I say manage the bench. Now, they've implemented this. How it's going to work? I think it's going to work because I think it's a solution. It needs to be mandated. It doesn't mean need to be mandated on us, but on coaches coming up, being bred as players who've experienced that upbringing. Here's the consequences. It's at the very bottom and it's fairly small print. First time there's a violation, there's a warning. Second time, one month suspension. Third time, one year. Fourth time, indefinite suspension. Upon review and is indefinite, suspended indefinitely upon review by the branch. Now, the only other time you can shorten the bench, so to speak, they describe is with injury or a goalie that is down five goals. Pretty simple. So I'm really curious about everybody's thoughts on this. And Tim, you did have your hand up. I'm wondering if you wanted to sort of kick off some discussion on this. No, I was actually thinking the other way, Wally, uh, and it's good to see Mike on. But if, uh, like I did look at the document the other day, I was going to suggest that um, <laughs> we maybe table this whole discussion for another week until people could have a chance to really take a look at it. I took a, a quick look at it yep. and it is a really good document, um, but it's pretty hard to talk about if you, you know, I mean, you get you get the gist of what it's about, but if people haven't had a chance to look at it, then, you know, it's like having a meeting where you get the agenda when you go into the meeting and you don't, <laughs> you know, you it's like, well, why didn't I get this three days ago so I could, formulate some thoughts and give some feedback but that was that was where I was going to go but it's uh, anyway Hal, Hal's got his hand up so I was going to I was going to deflect maybe till next week but go ahead Hal. Hal your speaker. My speaker's working good my mic was off. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> and your <laughs> mind not so and your mind not so well. <laughs> <laughs> so this I like that doc I think it was I think it's great um, I had actually dinner last night with the, the two my assistant coaches from this last winter and we we're talking about how we're gonna in our program and I've mentioned this to you before about putting accountability in uh, for coaches players and, and, and adults um, my experience is that because um, we I've been a strong pro proponent for 25 years of no short benches, let the kids play, manage your bench at the end of the game if the game matters. If winning the game buys you another game, but if it doesn't, you know, let everybody play um, and be smart about how you do it. The biggest problem, and we talked about this last night, is everybody does, everybody agrees with this at the beginning of the season, right? Then the season starts and everybody's gone. I mean, you know, and coaches and managers are scheduling games and there's no oversight, there's no accountability. So without having somebody in a, an accountability role to hold the coaches accountable, what that means, you've got to have 
you know, um, I guess they, they did this in our program a year ago. I didn't, I wasn't aware of it, but the guy got so burnt out because he was, all he was doing is running around, you know, supervising 45 teams or something. And I said, well, the answer to that is we get, you know, we get a group of four or five of us and we each focus on a different age level and we're not there to run their practices, but we need to show up and make sure that whatever framework we eventually agree, agree on and how we're going to run practices and what types of things we're going to focus on, that they're actually doing that. And one of the guys, um, he's got, his son was on my team this last year. In fact, I just got a note from him. He says, the best year of hockey I ever had, um, and, and uh, you know, which is nice to get from a player. Um, and even though he broke his wrist a month before the end of the season, he continued to come to practice and just skate every day. And he was on the bench and he was, he was terrific. He has a younger brother playing and the dad has sort of been an assistant coach on these teams, but he says every coach has like their favorite drills and there's no consistency in what we're doing with the players, with the kids. And I said, well, the goal is to, to build in a, at least a broad framework that the coaches can work within, whether it's hard skills, soft skills, game skills, and then give them a whole range of, and teach them how to do this. And then we go back and watch and see if they're doing it. And if they're not doing it, then, you know, there will be consequences or there'll be changes for accountability. And, um, and, and, but this relies, uh, this requires a lot of, um, you know, this, you have to do, you got to structure it, you got to teach them, you got to bring the coaches in and explain to them what we're doing. And, and, and you got to engage them and get their buy-in. And if they don't buy in, they probably shouldn't coach in our program. They should go somewhere else, which is pretty hard in Minnesota. It's hard to go someplace else. Um, we should give them a release and say, go, go, go somewhere else. But I don't think that'll happen. I think everybody wants that to, to be successful. So, um, you know, we won't use that exact format, but Wally, that's a, the newfies have got it right. <laughs> and it's, uh, uh, but I'm sure as Mike knows out east, it, this is a hard. This is hard to do, right? Because um, everybody, everybody thinks a short bench is fine because their kid's not going to be sitting on the bench <laughs> when the time comes. Their kid's going to be on the power play. <laughs> well, it's not hard to do when you're the prime minister, and yeah. <laughs> there's not a democracy. The hockey governing body that would put the rubber stamp on this. It's up to the association to buy-in, and coach education begins by being certified on it. And so that's where I'm saying what I've been trying to do for years is being implemented. That's why the guy sent it to me. Yep. He, he respects what we are doing. It's what we're talking about. And lo and behold, an association, a governing body has come out with it, and I can't couldn't get Hockey Alberta to even let me pilot the mission statement exercise. Oh. So I may go to Hockey Newfoundland uh, to see if they would pilot this uh, mission statement exercise because I really believe that the exercise is something to be done at the coach's certification, but I've discovered with Tom's team it's not as important as doing it with the parents at a practice. They all have to drive their kids to the practices. So up to the U15 age, including U15s, there's going to be parents at the practice waiting to pick them up, watching. And in the one hour and a half or hour ice time that I delivered to Tom's family, uh, parents, the mission statement exercise, and they produce this mission statement that I keep in front of me, and I have it holding it up right now. It's amazing what they've gone through. So with the association here in Calgary, 
Uh, I'm hoping to do that at the U13 level with three teams next year, where I will deliver that exercise uh, to the coaches separately because they're not getting it revealed to it uh, through coach education. So as an association, it's mandated that the coaches, all coaches go through the exercise. But with those three age groups, I will personally do it with the parents. And then I'll go to games. Now, there's no problem with the allocation of ice times at the U13 level. The two teams that I work with, Tom's and Wes's, uh, they, they're masters at playing everybody. Tom's a master at playing everybody and getting a result. And it, it's because he brings in that the hard skills, soft skills, and the game skills in a very irrespensable manner where it gets success, much like you did hell with your team. Took a season, but that's technical expertise that I'm not sure governing bodies can, are able to deliver on as they did back in our day. So, uh, Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you.